Welcome back to the video darkroom. In this video, we're going to be looking at three different approaches to macro photography, and I'm going to be using three different pieces of equipment. They cost a very different amount and they are easier or harder to use and they produce reasonable results or excellent results. So let's just have a look at these three techniques and see which might be right for you if you're thinking of getting into macro photography or thinking of improving the standard of the macro photography that you're already doing. For the purposes of this video, we're going to be using this RAF Red Arrows Special Edition Citizen Watch. It's really nice watch face suitable for macro photography and has a lot of detail on it. In case you're not aware, the Red Arrows are the aerobatic display team for the RAF, the Royal Air Force. The first piece of equipment um, is going to be these um, little extension tubes. This is a set that I picked up from Newer off Amazon. There are two extension tubes. One of them is a 10 millimeter and the other one is a 16 millimeter. And you can put them both together in order to create a 26 millimeter extension, uh, which is quite useful if you add it to a 50 millimeter lens, then um, that will give you quite a good degree of macro. They cost about £30 in the UK and about $29 um, in the US if you're buying them from Amazon. And the second item of equipment that we're going to have a look at is this 90mm macro lens. I'm shooting on Sony, so this is the Sony 90mm macro f2.8 and it's an excellent lens. Um, it's certainly good for macro, but it's not only useful for macro it's a great lens in general if you want something a little bit longer than the average 50 millimeter but maybe not as long as a as a 200 millimeter telephoto so it's a really good uh, mid-range um, tele lens for general use but um, it's particularly good for macro and you can pick up this lens for about £719 in the UK or $1,089 if you're looking on Amazon in the US. And the final piece of equipment that we're going to look at is uh, something that you may or may not have seen before. It's a focus slider and the way it works is it has adjustments that allow you to move the camera the camera gets mounted on here and this piece gets mounted on the tripod so with the whole thing set on the tripod then you can move your camera forwards and backwards very precisely and you can see that there is a scale on it that um, uh, allows you to see how much you're moving it and if you need to move it side to side you can do that um, by moving it along that way and the camera will move in a very smooth and controlled manner so that's a focus slider and again you can pick up one of these on amazon in the uk for 19 pounds or in the us for 79 pounds now the one that's in the us is a newer version than the one that it's not only from newer but it's a newer version as well um, and it has metal knobs on it as opposed to the plastic one so that may account for why it's 79 dollars uh, whereas the uk one is only 19 pounds those are the pieces of equipment that I'm going to use. You'll find that they are quite different and we're going to have a look and see how they work in practice now. So the differences between these are that when we look at the extension tubes, they're very cheap. They don't cost very much money, but they're quite difficult to use. It's quite hard to get things in focus and um, because they are, things move very quickly in and out of focus and it's very hard to get the precise um, positioning of them. And, and you've also got to decide whether you want one or the other one or both of them together um, in order to get the degree of magnification that you want. And they produce what I would describe as sort of medium level results. Um, really, we're going to see that at the end of the video. I'm going to compare the results from all three techniques here. The second is the macro lens that we we looked at earlier, and um, and it it produces really high quality results. It's very easy to use um, as well, but of course it's expensive. And then finally, there is the use of the focus slider. 
Now, the focus slider is not really, you know, like a prime element, like the lens that you might add and put on, uh, put the extension tubes between the, the lens and the camera body, but um, it's an add-on piece of equipment and it allows you to raise the standard of your work even further than simply using the macro lens on its own. If you use the macro lens on its own, you have this issue of getting everything in focus, of managing the depth of field. And one way to manage depth of field is to reduce your aperture down to something like f22 um, and have everything in focus from the front to the back, um, at least in the range that you're looking at in your macro photograph. But when you do that, it introduces an impediment to quality which is diffraction. You get diffraction on the edges of the very small iris um, or aperture that's in the lens, and that reduces the overall quality. So you really want to, to work with a wider aperture, and that would be something like f8 or f5.6 to get the maximum quality out of the lens, but then you've got limited depth of field, and that's where the focus slider comes in, because the focus slider will enable you to take several different images and then stack those together and have a high quality in focus range from front to back. So let's have a look at taking some photographs with the extension tubes, then with the macro lens on its own, and then with the macro lens on the slider and see how that works out in practice. We have set up the um, camera. Uh, it's at f2.8, as you can see. That gives us an exposure time of a tenth of a second. It's all a little mini tripod. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that and um, it's focused on the middle of the watch face. I've set up one of my custom buttons so I can zoom in on that and I can focus right in there. The tiniest movement moves the camera but I'm, I'm set to manual focus so we can focus on the, the center and then go back to view the full frame. So that's all that you get in focus at f2.8. So using my remote i'm just going to take a picture of that it's done that and then we're going to try the same again at f22 i just adjust my settings all the way down to f22 and you can see that we're now talking about an eight second exposure so the camera is now taking the eight second exposure Again, I use the remote to start it. It's doing long exposure noise reduction and by the same length of time. The image is now taken. If I press the play button on the camera, you can see now that that image, it looks fairly well in focus from beginning to end. If I go back to the previous one, you can see that there's very little depth of feel that's there. So that's how it all looks when we use the extension tubes with the 50mm f1.8. Let's now see how that works with the macro lens in place. So this time we have got the 90mm macro on the camera and we're at f2.8 again, ISO 100. If I adjust the focusing on this, you can see that it's it's really a lot easier. We've got a much bigger range of focus, so it's very much easier to, to get the focus right on. And if I zoom in, you can see on the little diagram that we're zoomed right in and we can actually pin the focus on that little rivet that is there holding the hand on and press that custom button again. Even though this is on a sturdy little tripod, you can see that the tiniest movement on it um, vibrates it. Let's take an image at f2.8. That's done. And then let's do just what we did before and take this down all the way to f22. And we get a 10 second exposure. Uh, the light has changed slightly. I think it was an 8 second exposure the last time, but... Um, Let's do this one now and um, take that image. So we're in the 10 seconds now.
exposure is done and we're getting the uh, long exposure noise reduction from the camera taking place at the moment and then we should have um, the image after that so the image should be here if I press play you can see that's the f22 image it all looks pretty well in focus and if I step back that's the f2.8 image and you can see that the very limited amount of the subject that is in focus there so that's all what that we need to do in this case let's move on to our third method which is to use a focus slider and focus stacking okay so this time we have the camera mounted on the focus slider i've now moved to manual exposure at uh, one second at f8 because since i'm taking several images i want them all to be exactly the same exposure and i don't want that to change as we move along and this time i'm not going to alter the focus of the camera but i am going to move the camera forwards and backwards on the focus slider so i'm going to zoom in on the image and i'm going to move right down to the bottom of the image which is here and i'm going to adjust the focus slider so that the bottom of the watch face is in focus which it is now we could zoom in a little bit further and finesse that but i think it's as close as we need to get it let's just put it right there press the custom button again and we can then take a picture with the remote that's done so now we need to zoom in again I'm going to step up three steps. I'm going to adjust the focus slider so that the image is in focus around the middle of the frame, uh, which it is now. We can move in, zoom in a little bit further and just verify. Let's just get that 45 right in focus there. That's done. Go back to the full frame. Press the shutter release on the remote take the picture and now we're going to go up another three steps and I'm just going to speed through the remainder of these images since the process for taking each one is exactly the same so we'll pick the process up on the last image that has to be taken we will have a little bit more in focus than you can see in the viewfinder here because that viewfinder is giving you what the image would look like at f2.8, but we're shooting at f8, so we'll get a little bit more than that in focus. Take the image, press the play button, and we step back through them. The hands are moving, but we, um, we get right through all the images showing. So I've loaded the images from our macro session into Lightroom. I have colored them as well. The first two images that are labeled in red are the two images from the 50 millimeter lens with the extension tubes. Then we have the two images from the 90 millimeter macro lens that um, were done at uh, f2.8 and then at f22, just like the 50 millimeter. And then we have the six images colored here in green that were taken with the focus slider as we took six images at f8, moving through the depth of the image that we were trying to capture. Let's just take a quick look at these. I'm just pressing F to bring them up. So this is the F2.8 image from the 50 millimeter with the extension tubes. If I move on to the next one, you can now see um, the, the 50 millimeter extension tube image, but this time it's at F22. We're going to be looking in detail at the quality of these at the very end once we've finished the processing. Moving on, this is the macro lens at f2.8 and the macro lens at f22. Then we have the images that were taken using the focus slider and you can see we're in focus at the bottom of the image. As we move through these you can see that the focus range is moving further up until we get everything sharp right up at the top of the image. So those are, are the images that we have. These two, I'm going to ignore the 2.8 images because 
they were just purely just to let you see what range of focus you get at various apertures but the two that we would probably be using from the extension tube technique and from the straightforward macro technique would be the ones shot at f22 because they're the only ones that get the whole of the watch in focus in order to process the images that were shot with the slider then we select them all we right click and choose edit in and then open as layers in photoshop so photoshop is going to load and then once photoshop loads it will open each of the images now these are um, 50 megapixel images from my Sony A1, so they are fairly big files. They're all raw images, so they're, they're, they're quite big files. So Photoshop is loading them one after the other. So we now have six images loaded into Photoshop as layers. So I'm going to select all six layers and we need to make sure that they are correctly aligned so we go to edit and then auto align layers and I just accept the auto suggestion here and click OK on that Photoshop will analyze all the layers and it will align them all so that they're all perfectly aligned which will be useful for when we come to blend them all the layers are now aligned and we're in a position to blend them. So again, it's edit and it's auto blend layers. We're going to use the stack option here and choose seamless tones and colors and click OK on that. And Photoshop now sets about blending these layers based on the parts of each layer that's in focus. So the end result will be that we get an entire image that's in focus as much as Photoshop is able to do it, which in this case I think should be pretty good. So I'm just speeding up going through the remainder of this and Photoshop has now blended all the layers and now you can see on the screen that we have an image that's in focus from the bottom through to the top. What I'm going to do now is flatten this image. I don't need to keep the individual layers that are here. So I'm just going to go to layer and flatten image. And we now have a file with a single layer in it. I'm just going to close that down and accept that we're going to save it. You can close down Photoshop and we're back into Lightroom. And in this case, we now have this new file that is the blended set of images all in one file. So I'm going to compare what we've got. I'm going to take this image, which is the F22 from the 1.8. I'm going to take this image and I'm going to take the new one that we've just produced. And I'm going to try to, in this case, just simply control U. The reason for that is that is doing auto settings on each of these images. I'm going to invert my selection here. So if I go to um, invert selection, I've selected all the images that I'm not interested in and I'm just going to unflag them by typing U. And that leaves me just simply the three images that are the final images that we want to compare. So let's have a look at these three images. I'm just going to press F to bring them up full. So this is the image for using the extension tubes. And you'll see it's actually pretty good. It's not a bad photograph of the watch. If we go on to have a look at the image from the macro lens, you can see that it's definitely better than the one with the extension tubes. So it's a lot of extra money for the macro lens, but it does produce a better job and it is very much easier to use in practice because of its ability to focus through such a wide range. And then if we go on to look at the final image, this is the one that was taken with the macro lens at f8, which is a more optimal aperture to be shooting at where you don't get the diffraction that you would get in the aperture at f22 and you don't get the shallow depth of field that you would get at a wider aperture. So what I'm going to do further is start with this image and I'm going to zoom in 
here to 200% and I'm going to look at the the logo that is on this watch and you can see that it's not perfectly sharp. Now we are looking at a 50 megapixel image and we're zoomed into 200% but I wanted to do that in order that you could see the difference between these images. So moving on now to the next image. This is the one using the macro lens and you can see that it is slightly better than the one using the extension tubes. And then finally, if we move on to the one using the focus slider at F8, you can see that that image is very much sharper and um, is a little bit embarrassing. The amount of dust that was on this um, watch when I photographed it. But I guess you need to make sure that you polish everything off and make sure there is no dust. The tiniest amount of dust is going to really show up in a macro photograph. So that shows you the um, three techniques that there are. This is easily the cheapest um, way to do this. This is a lot more expensive. And this one is not only more expensive, but it's more work. But if you really want to get an optimal result, then I recommend using a focus slider and just taking the extra time in order to do that. There are other advantages in a focus slider as well, and that is that you can very much center things more easily, uh, move back and forwards and organize your shoot much better with a focus slider than you can if you're if you're just trying to manipulate using a tripod on its own. I hope you find that interesting. Um, I'd be really interested to know what your views are on shooting macro photography, as I'm sure many people have much more experience of this than I do. But I hope you enjoyed that video. And if you did, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you in the next one.